All right, so this is the abdominal and GI topics. And admittedly, this is not really an exciting section on the test. Um, some of these are big workups and a lot of these abdominal pain and belly pain labs and shotgun workups and all that. And there's not really a lot of exciting high speed emergencies with these per se. I mean, there's a couple. Um, I'll try and hit the high points and the things that help distinguish one from the other, but you're gonna see a lot of the same labs, a lot of the same complaints, the same findings on a lot of these. So in general, most of our abdominal problems are diagnoses of rule outs, meaning we're gonna do a bunch of tests to prove what is not going on because some of these things are not tests for, and then after these tests are normal or they don't point in the right direction, we have to say, okay, well, what pattern could this fit? So a lot of rule outs here. And gastritis is one of these. You know, there's no test for gastritis. Um, it's basically just some irritation of the gut, some inflammation. They, you know, they ate something that didn't agree with them, or, you know, they're taking 800 of ibuprofen three times a day for six months. You know, something's irritating the line of the gut. The ultimate fix for this is to remove whatever's irritating it. So, you know, quit taking so much ibuprofen, quit binge drinking every weekend, things like that. And their presentation can really be anything, you know, any type of abdominal pain, you know, but it be, you know, squeezing, uh, sharp, dull, whatever. Now, if they continue to do these things that irritate their gut, you can eventually lead to things like ulcers if it breaks down the lining. And we'll get there in a minute and talk about ulcers. The big concern there is that GI bleeding that happens with that. There's not a lot of symptoms specific to gastritis. Sometimes it's made better with food because if the gut is irritated and they eat something, something non-spicy, something kind of bland, um, it might help buffer some of that irritant that's in the gut. So maybe it kind of dilutes it a little bit. So sometimes it's better with eating, but not always. You know, abdominal um, bowel sounds could really be anything. So there's not a lot of physical clues that help us with making this diagnosis. And these are a lot of those million dollar belly lab workups. I mean, we've got to check for gallbladder. We've got to check for pancreatitis. Um, you know, ruling out the other possible mimics that could be going on here that do have tests for them, but gastritis doesn't. So the rest of their workup should come back normal. And then we had to go back and talk about that history. Like, wait, where could this be coming from? You know, are you taking things like a bunch of non steroidals? Um, is there a chance you could have, you know, been eating stuff that's just, you know, not, doesn't sit with you well? Things like that. Let's talk about NG tubes for just a minute. In the real world where we all work, we don't use NG tubes a lot. And what I don't want you to do is go into this exam and think if you see an NG tube as an option that like, we don't do that, so it can't be the right answer. NG tubes, NG, NG tubes do have a purpose. And in some of these abdominal things, they may be like a second or third light intervention, especially if someone's still puking, they're still vomiting just you know off the chart and you've already given them a couple, two or three rounds of nausea medicines. There is a consideration for an NG tube at that point. So I don't want you to think that it's not something we never do except for bowel obstructions. It's just not the first line thing we do for things other than bowel obstructions. You're gonna see a lot of similar medicines here too. You're gonna to see the nausea medicines, the antacids, things like that. Now our, our only H2 blocker that's on the market right now is Pepsid. So um, those of you following along, if you see Zantac anywhere in my, in the, my textbook, make sure you change it to Pepsid only. Zantac was officially removed earlier this spring from every formulation. And then our PPIs, uh, Protonix is pretty much the most popular one we're all using in the hospital now. Pantoprazole, help with that, some of that acid blockade. With this person having this abdominal pain and probably some vomiting too, you know, they're not going home and eating steak and potatoes the first night. You know, as far as how long and how do they advance that diet? Well, that's up to the provider as they discuss the discharge plan with them. Um, some people they'll say clears for 24 hours, some people just for 12 hours. So just no, the knowledge here that's gonna be universal is none of these abdominal things are going home and eating steak and potatoes or greasy Waffle House that same night. They're gonna to have to progress it slowly. You know, we can't, if you, have a, if you have a sprained ankle, we can give you crutches and get you off the ankle. We can't take you off your gut. It's still gotta do its thing. So ulcers could be the next progression for recurrent gastritis, or they can be their own condition once we get to the point of ulcers, they're all gonna be treated the same though. So the where we came from to get these doesn't matter. It's once they're here, what are some of our big concerns? 
The big, biggest concern here is the risk of GI bleeding because sometimes these ulcers just kind of ooze slow and steady over months. It depends how big the ulcer is and how many they have. They may not even present to the ER until they show up, they're pale, they're pasty, they're hypotensive and orthostatic, they're passing out. Maybe this person hasn't noticed that their stools are changing and they've been turning black and sticky for several weeks. So sometimes the bleeding goes unnoticed. But that is the main concern with ulcers is that sometimes hidden internal GI bleeding. As far as where the ulcer is, for the exam, this isn't gonna be important because we're gonna treat them both the same in the ER, whether it's actually in the stomach itself or it's actually in the small intestine. We're still worried about GI blood loss. We're still worried about how are they compensating? Are they hypovolemic? Those kind of things. And we're gonna treat them basically the same with the antacids and such and assess their stability. So you see these words again under the descriptions here, usually, sometimes, things like that, because there's not as, a lot of these GI problems don't have a very predictable presentation every time. So of course, we're gonna do all these abdominal labs, this big workup again. If you suspect an ulcer and your patient's having out, any outward signs of it, the melana, that's the black sticky stool, maybe some vital sign abnormalities, you're, you know, even before you get the hemoglobin back on your CBC, be thinking about blood. The big thing again, risk for GI blood loss. So definitely some type and cross going on, getting ordered. Uh, a good provider is gonna be doing a rectal exam, checking to see if there's blood in the stool. If it's not visible, they're gonna do that rectal exam with the hemocult because sometimes that blood can be such a small quantity because it's so slow that it's actually not even visible, but it'll, it might show up on that hemocult slide. Now I still listed the same nausea medicines, the antacids, et cetera. I also added to this list narcotics. Now I don't mean the first thing you're gonna give them is a big old slug of Dilaudid, right? We're gonna try these other things, the nausea, the antacid medicines. You know, because this is an open wound or open sore inside the gut, a lot of times the other medicines don't work as well as we'd like them to. We're probably gonna have to give them some pain medicine also. It's not, an ulcer is an open wound, so it could be very uncomfortable. Now, if they get to go home and they're stable, in addition to maybe some prescription antacid medicines or things for ulcers, their diet, they don't necessarily need clears, but they definitely need bland stuff. We don't want them to have a lot of fiber, a lot of roughage in their diet. Remember, they have an open sore inside their gut. I don't want rough, mechanical, solid type foods. They're gonna irritate it even more. Now, the bowel obstruction, so this is not constipation. Some patients think that's what it is. In constipation, you still have the normal peristalsis happening. It's just the stool is not evacuating. In a bowel obstruction, the peristalsis is actually stopped. And when it stops, the gas is given off from the, the partially digested food and it starts to build a pressure in the bowel lumen. And that pressure stretches it. And as that bowel wall or lumen gets, as the lumen gets bigger, the bowel wall gets more thin. And as it gets thin, it's basically decreasing the perfusion to it. So the ultimate risk here at the bowel obstruction is bowel ischemia and or necrosis and or rupture. So there could be a, something really bad happen with a bowel obstruction. And this person, depending on how far along it's progressed, they can look actually septic when they present. They can actually look only mildly ill. I've seen it both ways. So their presentation doesn't dictate is about obstruction. Um, if they're vomiting fecal or stool-like material, that is very specific. That's, that's a very unique symptom to this. I'm not gonna say it's pathognomonic, but it's very highly specific. You can almost bet, if you see them vomiting stool, you can almost bet it's about obstruction. Now, if you could pick only one test to diagnose this, it's very useful, low cost, non-invasive, no side effects, quick, things like that. Your abdominal x-ray is gonna be your most useful. Yes, a CAT scan will see this all the time, but that's a lot of radiation cost. So on this exam, we always follow the thought process of going from simple, less cost, less invasive. And if I have a test that meets those, I'm gonna do that first. About 70% of the time, plain abdominal series will pick up on this. That's a good use of some inexpensive radiation and just 
three pictures. It's just a flat, an upright, and a KUB, make up your abdominal series. And this person needs that NG tube for sure. That, that's gonna be, unless they're actively vomiting, I would, you know, if they're actively vomiting, first line intervention is antimedics. But right behind that, once I get the diagnosis, I need to see an order for an NG tube because that NG tube is gonna pull the gas out of the gut and allow this very thin bowel wall, allow it to get thick again. In other words, it's gonna pull the gas out so the lumen gets smaller and that means the bowel wall gets thicker so it can perfuse itself. Because remember, that's our main concern here is bowel wall ischemia. This is a very typical bowel obstruction x-ray. They're not always this clear cut though, but this is a very good example. And what you see is these obvious, the, the loops excessively dilated. And this is the upright view. And this is one of the reasons an upright has to be part of this. Because the one where they're laying flat on the table is not gonna show the fluid levels because of gravity, they're laying flat. So the upright picture, they need to be sitting or standing. And because of gravity, the fluid will make these lines these little stair steps you see all throughout the bowel. Why are we seeing this? Because there's no peristalsis, so, and they're so distended in the lumens that the fluid that's stuck there, it settles out and makes a fluid line. If there's still peristalsis happening, the bowel lumen would be much smaller, and you wouldn't see these air fluid levels. <clears throat> Gastroenteritis, this is diarrhea. And there's many different causes. The most common one we'll deal with in the ER, almost across the board, is a viral gastroenteritis or viral um, diarrhea. The gastroenteritis is affecting the large intestine. And the function of your large intestine, or predominant function, is to reabsorb water from the stool material. So when the large intestine is infected or inflamed, it doesn't want to do that. It's like, I don't want to go to work today. I don't want to reabsorb no water. So we get this increased frequency of these watery-like stools. Possibly some blood in the stool also because your entire GI tract is very rich in its vascular supply. And it doesn't take a lot of inflammation or irritation to rupture some capillaries in there. And so we might actually have some bloody diarrhea from some of these inflammatory infectious causes. These are almost exclusively gonna be some contact precautions, so some hand washing, things like that. And a lot of times, especially the viral ones, is run through the family. You'll hear about someone else at home had something similar um, currently or just, recent, or just recently prior to this. Not a big concern on the exam to distinguish infectious versus inflammatory. They're both gonna present pretty much the same the diarrhea, the watery stool, maybe some blood in the stool, this intense left-sided, that large intestine, that lower GI tract, cramping, spasmodic kind of pain. Now, it's gonna make a difference to us as clinicians what's causing it, but that's where we gotta get things like those stool cultures, those gram stains to identify the specific agent. As far as first-line emergency nursing care, or emergency medicine care, it's gonna be you know, assessing the risk for infection, their fluid status, things like that. Food poisoning, it's not exclusively a diarrhea problem. It's gonna affect the entire GI tract, but I did put it under here because they can present with the diarrhea part. How would I know it's food poisoning? Well, there's a couple clues. One is it's always going to be the upper GI symptoms before the lower, because that's the direction that poisoned food or toxic, whatever, is going through the gut. It's going from the top down. So even though they may not show up to having diarrhea and this real bad cramping in their left side large intestine, when you talk to them, they'll say, yeah, a few hours ago, I was having upper abdominal pain, some nausea, some vomiting. It's following that predictable progression from top down. The other clue that is food poisoning is you're usually gonna have a cohort of similar patients with similar symptoms. So like multiple family members in a short period of time. You know, they all ate the same picnic or they all had the same um, you know, home spoiled leftovers or something. You may also see a cohort like of multiple people coming in from similar eating establishments like the local KFC on Highway 10. You know, all these people are coming in. Might be some health department or public health issues starting out. So look for that cohort and that predictable progression of upper versus 
uh, upper before the lower symptoms. So for all these diarrhea, infectious ones, we wanna get stool cultures. That would be the best test to actually identify the specific agents or the specific organisms. We don't always get those in the ER because sometimes that diarrhea dries up and it's hard to get, but that would be the most ideal thing. The other big thing with diarrhea is we've gotta look at their fluid balance. A lot of diarrhea is we don't necessarily treat aggressively on the first day or two as long as they're still hydrated well, because one of the ways we treat diarrhea by slowing it down also slows down the elimination of the pathogen. So a lot of times we don't get too aggressive treating these unless they're really at risk for fluid imbalance. So we got antiemetics for the nausea, uh, antibiotics if indicated. Let's talk about anticholinergics. So you have two main nervous systems. We talked a lot about the sympathetic from the cardiac. Well, we talked some about it. We talked about it more under the toxicology. But your sympathetic system is your fight or flight. Your parasympathetic system is the dominant one that controls your GI system. Those maintenance activities, those repair and restore activities. We call it the feed and breed or the rest and digest system. Your main transmitter of the, of the parasympathetic system is acetylcholine. So when we talk about GI problems, typically your, GI, your acetylcholine is at a much higher level trying to deal with the GI problem. And how do I suppress acetylcholine? I suppress it with an anticholinergic, okay? So anticholinergics have a large role to play in the GI system with a lot of these problems. It can help ease a lot of the symptoms. I've given you some examples here of some common agents or some common drugs from that family. All right, um, Bentol was actually first marketed for irritable bowel syndrome, which we'll talk about also, suppressing that overactive parasympathetic component. Um, you see the Donatol that was used in some of our GI cocktails in some places. That's why it was in there, because a lot of times these GI problems respond to these things. Um, I put narcotics here also, not, again, not that the first thing is a bunch of Dilaudid, but let's say for this really severe diarrhea, this really severe gastroenteritis, I've tried these other medicines, they're not working, patients still have a lot of distress. There's, there's actually two roles for narcotics or more specifically opiates for this. And I'm not talking going home with them, I'm talking about in the ER. One obviously is pain relief. You got this real bad spasming, large intestine um, kind of pain going on, they're doubled over, it's gonna help with that. Opiates also have an anticholinergic effect. They, they work on pain receptors and they also suppress acetylcholine a little bit too. So, you know, if you had to justify, well, why are you giving that person morphine for their belly pain? Well, I'm going to get a little bit of acetylcholine suppression too. And if you think about it, that's why we have opiate induced constipation as a chronic disease in people who are on chronic opiates because they're daily suppressing their acetylcholine and so they're slowing their gut down. Now that's with chronic long-term use. I'm just talking about, I've tried some other medicines on this ER patient, they're still doubled over. Yeah, I've actually got some science justification why something like morphine, a pure opiate, is actually gonna help in addition to the pain relief. So if I get to send this person home, they don't need hospitalization, um, they're not infectious, their CBC's okay, um, even if they're a little dehydrated, I tank them up. One of your main routes of transmission is direct contact. So I got to talk to them about good hand washing at home because I don't want to spread it around the family. And if this person is having recurrent diarrhea-like illnesses, at some point, somebody needs to say, hmm, maybe a GI consult is in your future because there are some chronic gastroenteritis-like presentations that are actually more of a chronic disease and you would need a GI doctor to identify those. We're, we're typically not in the ER going to identify Crohn's disease on a first presentation. We're typically not going to identify irritable bowel syndrome on a first presentation. But when there's repeat presentations, that's where referrals and consults come in to kind of narrow stuff down and say, hey, is this more of a chronic problem? Our reflux disorder, the underlying problem here is not the acid. The bigger problem is the lower esophageal sphincter is weaker and it allows the acid to more easily wash up and cause symptoms. So our, our yes, suppressing the acid helps minimize this because you're making less acid, but it does nothing to address the weak muscle here. And so our most therapeutic interventions are things that reduce 
the things that make this weaker. So obesity, um, with a bigger body size, bigger body habitus, there's actually more pressure, and possibly their stomach is also enlarged, maybe from overeating, that puts less tension here to keep it closed. The things we tell them to avoid, um, alcohol, smoking, all those different things that increase reflux symptoms, it will help with some of the acid production, but those things have also been shown to reduce that tone. So that's the underlying etiology to all of reflux. Symptoms can be very nonspecific. They can be the textbook heartburn symptom. They can also just be a pressure-like sensation or just a gnawing kind of sensation in that upper abdomen. Now the problem with a reflux presentation is when you look at the demographic of who's at more, most at risk for reflux, and you look at the age range, and you look at some of the things that make them more prone for it, like smoking or body size, you gotta consider, could this be a cardiac rule out thing? You know, we know that women and diabetics especially tend to have atypical cardiac symptoms. So just having some pressure, even though you think it's below the sternum, you know, like below the xiphoid, like upper abdominal, if it's a female in her mid 40s, she's diabetic and she's got some cardiac risk factor, she's at least getting an EKG. You know, so for the ENA, for this exam, you know, they're going to paint you. If they want to test your knowledge, does this person need an EKG? They're going to give you all the risk factors. And you're going to say, yeah, obviously this person has cardiac risk factors and this could be a cardiac mimic. They're showing up atypically. If they don't want to test, they're going to give you like a young 20 year old who should not have atherosclerosis, uh, probably doesn't have diabetes, things like that. Okay. So just consider. I'm gonna tell you for your clinical practice, a very safe rule of thumb that I learned was if we, if we set our, our line of decision-making, let me say it again, if we set the bar or the line, if I set it at the umbilicus, if I have any non-clear-cut pain above the umbilicus, the belly button, I'm getting an EKG regardless. By setting at the level of the belly button, I'm not gonna miss atypical cardiac presentations. I'm be doing a, a lot of extra EKGs, but an EKG is cheap. It can be a lifesaver and it's quick and it's non-invasive. So for me, personal practice, any unexplained abdominal pain above the belly button, I get an EKG regardless. And then I'll decide do they need enzymes based on their risk factors. So a lot of these medicines that work on the acid, remember, none of these medicines actually alter that esophageal sphincter. They're just helping to reduce the acid content, so hopefully there's less of it to wash up through that open sphincter muscle there. And again, you don't need any dosages or rates or amounts. So ultimately, long-term, this person needs to do those activities that help keep that sphincter, that muscle, tight and not stretched and not relaxed. So they don't need to eat two or three large meals a day. Better for them to probably eat three to five smaller ones, so they're not stretching their stomach all the time. At home, I'm gonna recommend when they sleep, they sleep with the head of the bed elevated some because if they got bad reflux and they go home and lay flat in the bed, during the night, this weak sphincter can allow more and more of this acid to wash up and it can accumulate and they're not gonna notice the burning because they're sleeping. They may wake up suddenly with an esophageal spasm which feels like choking. And they will come to an ER for that because your brain, will, an esophageal spasm to your brain feels, can feel like a windpipe issue. So if they'll sleep with their head their bed up some or on an adjustable bed or on several pillows, it's going to help minimize the likelihood of something like that happening. <clears throat> Under GI, I've got two pediatric specific topics from the blueprint, uh, the bowel interception and the pyloric stenosis. So what happens in this condition is the bowel folds or telescopes into itself. And where it folds, for whatever reason, the reason is not important, it's just what's the deal once it does happen, because this kid's gonna be sick. When it folds, this tissue where it's folded is very angry, it's very pissed off. It's upset, okay? It doesn't like this. And that's gonna start 
so an inflammation response. And one of the things with inflammation is mucus or inflammatory fluid gets secreted. So there's gonna be mucus being produced in here, which is gonna come out through their stool. And also these very sensitive, fragile capillaries of the lining may rupture. So I'm gonna have mucus and fresh blood mixed together and that comes out with our textbook word of current jelly stool, like a very gelatinous bright red. The reason it's bright red blood is because any large intestine bleeding, there's no absorption, there, there's no digestion in large intestine. So any fresh bleeding, those are fresh blood cells come out, so they're bright red. Your dark stools, your dark black stools, those are upper GI bleeding, because they've been through the absorptive process. And so those red blood cells have been broken down and so they come out as black sticky. So black sticky, melana, upper GI. The bright red, hematochesia or hematochesia, however you say it, that signals a lower GI problem. And so that's what this kid will have is that mucus and that fresh blood, the current jelly stool. The other phrase we have here is sausage shaped mass. If you could palpate deep enough on this child, they're in a lot of distress. They're probably not gonna let you examine them thoroughly. But if you could, this whole area here may feel firm and elongated like a link of sausage you get like at the IHOP or Denny's or whatever. Just a firm, elongated area. We call it sausage-shaped mass. Once the clinician has figured out this is probably a bowel obsession, obsession, intussusception, the best test is one that also fixes it sometimes. Now, they may already have a CT scan done, but a CT doesn't fix them. If you can, again, using the mindset of, if I can do an intervention or some action that not only addresses it, but also fixes it, why not do that? In this case, doing a barium enema under ultrasound or fluoro, it will diagnose it, and sometimes it will actually fix it. So that's a good choice. So this kid needs a, some rectal barium, which will go into the intestine and it will light up this area here so it'll be seen. And then sometimes the barium itself, either the weight of it pushing down or if it fills in the voids and kind of dilates out a little bit, may actually cause this to unfold and untelescope. And that'd be great because we fixed it then. Right. So a barium enema and then it has to be specifically either ultrasound or fluor fluoroscopy. The, these two tests show live living images. A CT shows a static image. So they can actually watch and see where that barium goes and see the area where the peristalsis is stopped. So it has to be live images. So it's kind of good for the test. You might get the barium part right, but don't pick barium enema and CT scan, pick barium enema and then look for either ultrasound or fluoro. The pallor stenosis is the other pediatric one from this. And this is a problem with the pyloric valve. So up here we have the lower esophageal sphincter. Down here we have the pyloric valve. It's called the pyloric valve because the lower half of your stomach is called the pylorus. The upper half is called the antrum. So the pyloric valve, and it's stenotic or it's tight, which means closed, so there's no food, no fluids, no nutrients getting to this kid. Nothing is absorbed in the stomach. This is just mechanical breakdown. This is where your absorption happens. So this kid's gonna always be hungry because they're never getting any nutrients and they're gonna be eating all the time. But what are they gonna be doing? They're gonna eat, 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 stomach's gonna get full and tight and it's gonna explode out that, they should have a normal esophageal sphincter. <laughs> it's gonna explode through there and we get the projectile vomiting. And on physical exam, if we could feel deep enough, we might feel this firm area where it's overgrown and stenotic and tight. And we might describe it like an olive-shaped mass or tumor or something like the word grape-like, something to indicate like a rounded, firm area. Now, it's not a tumor like a cancer, but that just that word tumor gives you that visual rounded and firm area. So olive-shaped mass, tumor, or like a grape or something to connotate that firm, swollen area there. So this kid will be sick enough to wind up in the CT scanner, and we'll see this. 
and then we're going to call PGI or transfer like to a children's hospital and they'll go down with an endoscope and they can open this and fix this at the same time. We'll still do the basic stuff. This kid's probably dehydrated. So we give kids some fluids, uh, still having the projectile vomiting. So some pediatric dosed antiemetics, things like that. The end result, they need to go to a GI doctor urgently. Now appendicitis. So that's a lot more. I think all of us have seen at least one appendicitis case. All right. The textbook definition of appendicitis, it starts, and it, this is one of the diseases that seldom follows the textbook, but the exam, the CN exam does the textbook presentation. So take some reassurance with that. Textbook is a peri-umbilical pain. So the pain, even though they might show up tonight or today with this right lower quadrant pain, when I ask them, did you notice something yesterday? Has it changed any? They're going to say, yeah, it started around my belly button. So it's a peri-umbilical pain that migrates to the right lower quadrant. And I'm gonna take a moment and distinguish these two words. A migratory pain is not the same as a radiating pain. In a radiating pain, you still feel it in both places. You feel it where it starts and you feel it radiating somewhere else. In appendicitis, the pain literally gets up from the peri-umbilical and migrates or moves to the right lower quadrant. So at the time of their right lower quadrant pain, according to the textbook, the periumbilical pain is gone. Kind of like how birds migrate south for the winter. That's where, so actually two specifically different terms there. We want to recognize where McBurney's point is because if we document that, that's a very specific location. It's not just right lower quadrant. It's a very specific, it is right lower quadrant, but it's a very specific location. In other words, if you tell, you know, you bring a patient back from triage and you say, hey, um, doc so-and-so, I've got a belly pain in room four, yada, 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 et cetera, and they have tenderness over McBurney's point. By you choosing those words, McBurney's point, you have just communicated to that provider that you were suspicious for appendicitis and you actually assessed it specifically for that end result. You know, and if, let's say you were convinced it's not appendicitis. You're gonna say, no, there's no tenderness over McBurney's point. Just by using that choice of words connotates that you're specifically considering this or dis discounting it as part of the workup. So it is halfway between the belly button and the most anterior superior part of the iliac spine or crest. Just read that word slowly. So the most forward, so in other words, like if they're laying on their back, the first, the most, the highest bony part you can find and the most superior the highest, so the most forward upper part of their pelvic crest, halfway between those two. Now, we may also see Rosping's sign, which is where it's a right lower quadrant pain. You're gonna palpate deeply on the left lower quadrant. Now, it's not the rebound where you let it jump back quickly, but just increasing the pressure on the left side also increases pressure on the right, and they're gonna say it hurts worse over here. But it's like, boom, I'm pressing on the left side is because you're increasing the lower abdominal pressure, putting pressure on that hot inflamed appendix. So for our, our abscessed appendix, the CT will be the most precise to find that. And I think you see us using that most often. It picks up on the abscess very easily. Ultrasound is not always the best, especially if the appendix, say they're there with right lower quadrant pain and you know, appendicitis is one of your differentials, but they're not looking sick. Sometimes the ultrasound doesn't see the normal appendix very well because the normal appendix is kind of collapsed on itself. If it's abscessed, it's swollen, it's enlarged, and a CT will see that very well. And of course, they need to see a surgeon as they get admitted. <clears throat> Our pancreatitis. So chronic pancreatitis will not be on this exam. Not that they can't be an emergency patient and not that they can't have uh, a serious problem. The reason chronic pancreatitis is not likely to be on exam, I've never seen it, is because one way we assess for pancreatitis is looking at the lipase to elevate. And some of these chronic pancreatitis patients, they don't elevate their lipase because they burn it up, basically. Their pancreas is basically dysfunctional. So a chronic pancreatitis can present with pancreatitis acutely, but they can't mount that lipase response sometimes. So for, the, for this exam, you couldn't pick that as a test for them. You wouldn't know. The acute pancreatitis is definitely a fair game question here because the most common acute pancreatitis, in other words, the otherwise healthy person, is a gallbladder problem, 
not really a pancreas problem, but it's a gallbladder and you've got to fix the gallbladder to fix their pancreas. So this is what I'm talking about here. The gallbladder and the pancreas are tied together by the biliary system. And if you have gallstones in the distal collection duct, those stones are also obstructing the pancreas drainage, making the pancreas get inflamed and edematous and dysfunctional. So it's not a pancreas problem, it's a gallstone problem for your acute one-time, first-time pancreatitis patient. Now, sometimes these gallstones are up in the, the gallbladder or in the proximal uh, system, that's fine. It's when they're in this common system down here that they're obstructing both. So to assess pancreatitis, we look at the lipase. We always have to look at the gallbladder also, because if the gallbladder or these stones are the problem, they need to be what's fixed. Okay. These two organs are related together. So lipase will be the most specific enzyme or chemical, chemistry, whatever, we can measure for that because lipase is secreted from the pancreas. And when it's acutely angry, irritated, it's gonna be elevated. One of the triggers for pancreatitis that triggers it to flare up, things like alcohol or carbohydrates. Because of the digestive nature of lipase, a large intake of alcohol or carbohydrates can cause the pancreas to suddenly have to go to work very aggressively and could send it over the, over the cliff to an acute pancreatitis. And we might consider this a cardiac rule out also. Hey, let me... Okay, so um, those could be triggers for pancreatitis. Um, the same risk factors that start to overlap cardiac risk factors, age, lifestyle, um, comorbidities. This could be one of those atypical cardiac presentations. So based upon the risk factors and the age, we might be doing that EKG or maybe just one set of enzymes. I'm going to leave this picture up here and I'm going to use this to describe more of how we diagnose pancreatitis. So you saw the previous picture with the, the drainage duct down here being blocked. So I measure lipase to tell me if the pancreas is involved. If it's elevated, I know I have at least pancreatitis. I don't have a test, a lab test for the gallbladder. How do I test the gallbladder lab-wise? I test the liver, all right? If I have lipase elevated, but liver enzymes normal, I know it's just a pancreas problem. If I have lipase elevated and liver enzymes elevated, I know it's from the gallbladder because remember the gallbladder has a shared pathway to both. And then I go get my CT or my ultrasound. Okay, so that's the, that's the thought process that we use on this. If it's just the lipase, then that means it's not a gall and the liver enzymes are normal. It's not a gallbladder problem. It's, and it's a true acute pancreatitis. If it's the lipase, and the liver enzymes are up, I need to go look at the gallbladder then. Because if there's an obstruction here, it's gonna affect both organs. Okay. So we're going to avoid morphine if possible, because morphine may exacerbate or make gallbladder pain and spasm worse. And I just told you the number one acute pancreatitis is a gallbladder problem. So it's not that you can't use morphine, because it'll still work on the pain receptors, but given the choice of morphine versus any other narcotic, pick the other narcotic. It is science that morphine can increase gallbladder spasm. It doesn't routinely happen though. It's kind of a sacred cow that we just never question. But for the exam, I want you to know that, that bit of some science, which is pick, if they give you morphine and no other significant pain relieving medicine, go ahead and pick the morphine. Chances are you're not gonna make it worse. But if they, let's say answer A is morphine and B is Dilaudid, and you're dealing with a gallbladder problem, pick the Dilaudid, okay? So that was the pancreatitis. Now let's talk about the gallbladder by itself. So now just a gallbladder problem, no longer a pancreas, but just a gallbladder problem. The most common overall will be stones. A lot of people have gallstones. They're not typically an emergency, but the one that's always an emergency is if your gallbladder is abscessed, because that means it's full of pus and the risk for infection. So if you, have, if you have gallstones and you come to ER, okay, and we notice your liver enzymes are up, but your pancreas is normal, that tells me it's just the gallbladder now, 
if there's stones and your liver is not being you're not being adversely affected or you're not being sick, you probably get to go home and have elective surgery. If your gallbladder is abscessed, you're staying in the hospital and going to surgery. Usually in the morning if they've been in PO overnight. So an abscess gallbladder does not go home. Gallbladder can be triggered by the things that relate to what it does. The gallbladder secretes bile and bile is released in response to some, some meal that has a higher fat content because bile breaks down fat. So if your gallbladder is kind of on the edge, those stones aren't really obstructing and also need a big greasy Domino's deep dish Chicago style extra cheese pizza, that gallbladder is going to go to work really harsh to start dealing with all that fat content. And that may be what caused it to clamp down those stones and send you to your local ER. So high uh, fats trigger gallbladder. Murphy's sign is a kind of like we talk about McBurney's point under appendicitis. Gallbladder has Murphy's sign, which is kind of specific for it. And this is actually a two part response. Basically you're getting your fingers under the rib and behind the liver, trying to get your fingertips right on the gallbladder. And if that gallbladder is angry, it's not just right upper quadrant tenderness. That's one thing. But again, when we're specific, it's so angry, they're actually, it's, it's not a reflex. It's just a certain way people always respond to this. They're going to suddenly, as you hit it just right, they're gonna <gasps> catch their breath, and at the same time, give this facial expression. All right, so Murphy's sign is not just tenderness, but it's specifically the <gasps> catching the breath and the facial expression. Again, you know, you tell a provider or another teammate, it's got a positive Murphy sign in room six, they know your mind has specifically considered a hot gallbladder and you've actually assessed specifically for that. Okay, so Murphy sign, catching the breath <gasps> and that look on their face. So a lot of the similar tests we do for the pancreatitis, um, whether it be, if they're more looking for stones, stones tend to be more visible on ultrasound. Now a person with stones should not be toxic, septic, SERS criteria, because they're not infected. If they have any signs of infection, SERS, lactic acid, sepsis, whatever, they're going to the scanner because the scanner will show that abscessed best. That's kind of how most of us decide ultrasound versus CT. Are they sick and looking septic? You get a CT, I'm looking for an abscess. Are they just in pain and they're not toxic? I'm getting an ultrasound, that will show me the stones best. Remember, stones get to go home if you're stable, abscess has to stay. And we're gonna be careful that morphine again also. Again, not that you can't give it, but if I have the option to pick an alternate opiate, I'm gonna pick the alternate one because I don't want to possibly cause that theoretical risk of making the gallbladder pain worse. If you have these weak spots, these little pouches or blebs on your large intestine, those are called diverticula. And your disease of having those is diverticulosis. Diverticulosis just means you own them, you have them. When they become inflamed or infected, that's when it's diverticulitis. That's when the, many people have diverticulosis, they don't even know it. It doesn't cause problems by itself. It's when they get inflamed or infected and become diverticulitis temporarily, because hopefully they'll clear up and go back to the baseline. That's the person who'll come to the ER. And because they're possibly inf infected with uh, abscess-like material or pus, they could be presenting like with fevers, they could be presenting with blood in their stool also. Remember, intestinal lining, very rich in capillaries, very sensitive. And if these little pockets have stuff trapped in them or infection in them, the tissue is angry and easy for the capillary blood, the capillaries to rupture. And what color will that blood be when it comes out? It's large intestine. Is it going to be dark or bright? It's going to be bright red because it's undigested blood. We usually don't consider this in someone under 50 because it takes years of just tissue breakdown and aging to cause these weak spots. It's not that it's impossible in someone that's 30, it's just not likely and that's the zebra in the desert that we don't go looking for and we don't go looking for an exam. So the ENA will not, they'll not present you with someone who's, you know, 
45, you know, that's borderline. I'm going to say 40. That's kind of borderline, right? I don't know. It's kind of close to 50, but it's not 30. They'd give you, for this, they'd give you someone definitely like 55 or 60. And you're like, yep, diverticulitis is definitely a possibility on this patient. And it's going to be that large intestine left side pain. And if they've got more of those little pus pockets, then they might start mounting that fever response, maybe that SIRS criteria. And our CT scan is going to show these very easily. These are very, very dense, very solid. And CT picks up on solid, dense structures best. So they'll be very obvious on CT scan. So textbook medicine recommends that you admit diverticulitis because of the risk of potential rupture and sepsis from some of those um, abscessed areas. But let's look at it practically. Um, as you've probably seen with a lot of patients, we send a lot of these home as long as they're stable. They're not toxic. They're not septic. The potential is all those infected pockets could rupture and spread infection intra, intra, into the peritoneal cavity, the abdomen. But these aren't the same as an appendicitis. You, now, this is a normal appendix here. But just imagine a big five, six centimeter appendix with like a third or a half a cup of pus rupturing. That's going to be a bad day for that person. If these little pockets rupture, I mean, are they all going to rupture? I guess it's a chance they could. They could all rupture at once, but is it likely? No. And they only have a small amount of infectious material. So the potential does exist for them to rupture and get septic, and hence the recommendation for admission. But the practicality of that always happening is actually very small. So I need to, I need to identify my patient. Is this a candidate to go home, or do they need admission? And let's face it, we don't have hospital beds, right? So who would be a good diverticulitis to go home? Well, a person that has access to follow-up, a person that can keep their antibiotics down, a person that knows what signs and symptoms to watch for if things start to change, a reliable patient, one that's semi-intelligent. That'd be the ideal, and obviously not toxic, that'd be the ideal one to send home. Let's not type a hospital bed. A lot of these revolve, resolve on their own with right treatment. And so by identifying that good candidate, you have now just identified who the bad candidate would be also, the one that doesn't fit that picture, okay? So that's, even though textbook says you admit them because of the potential, that's how we do with it in real life. Uh, medicines, this needs to be both Cipro and Flagyl, it's not an either or. This is standard medicine for diverticulitis. The combination of both Cipro and Flagyl is going to address the entire spectrum of the potential gut bugs that could be causing those abscessed areas. And of course, they'll probably get some pain medicines, maybe some antidiarrheals, but the mandatory is Cipro and Flagyl. Irritable bowel syndrome, or IBD, so this, of course, is a chronic condition. The patient will already have this as a diagnosis. We do not diagnose it off one ER visit or even two. It usually requires a GI doctor to exclude other causes. But it's thought to be an overreactive colon or spastic or hyper-responsive. And one of the things of their condition is they have the acetylcholine of that parasympathetic system at a higher level. So one of their treatments, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is an anticholinergic like the bentol or dicyclamine is the generic to help suppress that. They may be on it as a maintenance medicine too. Right. That we do know also that there's a strong association with stress and anxiety or depression with this. Not that they've done, uh, not to my knowledge, they've done control studies, but what we do know is patients who are on antidepressants and have irritable bowel have a better quality of life, less flare-ups, uh, less frequent of exacerbations, things like that. So there is some, there is evidence to that. And they're going to present with a left side abdominal pain. It's a large intestine problem. It's a lower GI problem. Crampy, spasmodic, maybe some bowel changes. Some of them have, uh, some of them will cycle between constipation, diarrhea. Some have predominantly one over the other. When this person comes in though, what I want to ask them is, is there something different about today's presentation? And I'm not asking, is the pain worse? You need stronger pain meds. 
but you know, normally you have left side crampy pain and now today you're having right side like a dagger pain, that's something different. I need to work that up. At the end of the day, if their exacerbation is consistent with their prior ones, I don't need to reinvent the wheel on this person. You know, if long well, they're not showing a fever, um, they're not orthostatic, things like that. The one test I'm going to do, at a, now I'll, I'll do a basic CBC in chemistries because sometimes other conditions will show up on those. But do I need to rescan them all the time? No. I do need to do a sed rate though. Remember from endocarditis, sed rate measures inflammation. Irritable bowel is not an inflammatory condition. Well, why am I getting a sed rate then? I'm proving that it's not another chronic abdominal problem that is inflammatory, like Crohn's can present similarly to irritable bowel. And an inflammatory disease gets steroids. So Crohn's disease would have a positive sed rate and they get steroids as part of their treatment. Irritable bowel, sed rate would be normal. They don't get steroids, okay? Because these two can present the same. That might be the one test that, is, I mean, is it is it likely that someone has both irritable bowel and Crohn's disease you know, as part of their history? No, is it possible? Yeah, but just not likely. But again, because the treatment would be completely different. One gets steroids, one doesn't. So antidiarrheal is also, especially if that's part of their pattern, we talk about the anticholinergics to suppress that overly sensitive or that overly irritable large intestine, knocking down the acetylcholine levels. Again, bental was a good choice for a lot of these people. And then they need lots of fiber in their life. They need regularity. It's been shown that having a very poor diet, you know, with not a lot of fiber and just very bad bowel habits can predispose or make these flare-ups more likely. So they, you know, even if it means they need to take a fiber supplement twice a day, they need fiber, they need regularity. Our esophageal varices. So if I asked you, um, if I asked you right now before we talk about it, what's the most likely patient with this? Everybody's gonna say an alcoholic. We need to go a bit deeper into that because one of the medicines we use to help treat this is not because they're an alcoholic, but because of their actual etiology. The underlying etiology for all of esophageal varices, in other words, the big umbrella that covers all of them is portal hypertension due to some chronic liver disease. Now, a large number of those people are alcoholics. In other words, I don't want you to think that bleeding varices are exclusive to alcoholics. Bleeding varices are potential for anybody with portal hypertension. So what do we mean by that? The portal circulation, which is supposed to pull the venous blood back from the upper GI tract to the liver, the portal circulation, it's got too much pressure in it because the liver is diseased and too much pressure in this portal venous system is causing some of these small venules to stretch and push through because of too much pressure. Now, alcoholism may have led them to their liver disease, but it was their liver disease that led to the portal hypertension. And there's other things that can give us liver disease. The concern with the bleeding varices is this is venous bleeding, so sometimes it can be slow. It can go unnoticed. I mean, they're not all going to rupture. They don't have to all rupture at once. If only one is nicked and bleeding, it may just be a little trickle of blood going in the stomach, going down the intestines. And, you know, over weeks, they're like, oh, my stools are getting black and sticky. I didn't notice it. Now, it could be an aggressive bleed and multiple ruptures, and they come in actually vomiting blood. So you can still have these and not present necessarily in a critical state. But the concern goes back to that whole thing I've said multiple times, that GI blood loss can go unnoticed and untreated for some time. Another picture just showing you that diseased liver causing an increase in the portal circulation pressure. So the little veins got to... This is kind of neat if you think about it. In your venous system with the letter V, too much pressure there causes varices. In your arterial system with letter A, too much pressure causes aneurysms. Kind of neat how those two letters link up there. Venous system, too much pressure, varices. Arterial system, too much pressure, aneurysms. All right, so depending on this patient's presentation, I mean, if they present shocky, orthostatic, pale, passing out, 
lethargic, you know, a type and cross might be one of the first things you do. Sometimes not. We may not recognize they're having this blood loss until their hemogram on their CBC comes back, or they report some very classic symptoms like they've been vomiting some blood, these black sticky stools. But the big thing here is sooner rather than later, we need to address the blood loss because they're probably going to be getting some blood replacement. And of course, we're looking at all the things with their liver, their liver enzymes, uh, their ammonia levels, their INR, because they've got this liver disease also. Now, the best treatment for any bleeding in emergency medicine is direct pressure. Kind of hard to get your finger in a gauze pad down here to put pressure on these. So we're going to put mechanical tamponade on there using what we call a Blakemore tube. Now, there's a couple of the names for it, but Blakemore tube is the most common name. That would be the one. They would either say, um, they would either say a mechanical tamponade device, which would be a generic name, or they'll say Blakemore. That is, the ENA does know the most common terms that we all use. So it would not be fair to call it something that only one hospital calls it. But Blakemore tube is the most common name for it. And it's gonna go down and we'll inflate one balloon and that's a retention balloon. It's just like on a Foley catheter. It's keep, this balloon is keeping it against the, the upper GI wall. And then we inflate the second balloon which is the one that's actually putting pressure on the bleeding sites. Now, this does not fix them. This buys them time till they get to a GI lab where a GI doctor can go down with an endoscope and whatever they do for these, they, you know, cauterize, ligate, band, whatever they're doing these days to actually take care of the bleeding. This just buys them time. Now, we do not put a Blakemore tube in unless someone is critical and not until we've secured the airway, which means they get RSI and get an ET tube because if they've got all this bleeding here, and you're, the, a lot of times putting this tube down it increases the blood production, the blood flow. I, I don't know what, how to say that better right now. But you've got to control the airway first before you do this. So we don't do this on a walkie-talkie patient. This person is critically ill. And then once that tube goes down, you have to pull counter traction on it. Pulling traction on it is keeping it pulled up against the top of the stomach to keep the tamponade balloon in the correct place. If you don't pull this traction, the tube can migrate or slide down and it's no longer doing its job then because it's not putting pressure on the bleeding area. So, and again, as I just said, this person's already intubated. They're already on some drips probably trying, because they're critical. Now, I told you that we want to understand that portal hypertension is the underlying etiology for all of these because there was a medicine tied to this. That is why sandostatin is one of the drugs that must be given for bleeding varices because it reduces portal hypertension. Now, it's like Lasix. It's not gonna save them immediately from the clutches of death, but it is so evidence-based that it needs to be one of our first drugs because it is therapeutic and because it takes time. I need to start working. And we're talking about a sandostatin drip, by the way. Okay, so you know, if I'd asked you at the start of this lecture, what do you use sandostatin for? A lot of people say for GI bleeds. Okay, we're gonna be more specific, specifically for portal hypertension causing bleeding varices because the therapeutic benefit is it reduces that portal hypertension pressure. They're probably getting some vitamin K because they got liver disease and their INR is probably elevated, so they're more at risk for bleeding. This person will go on that protonics drip. Now, the protonic, well, that's an antacid. Why am I doing this? <clears throat> Because where, where these erosions have exposed the vessels, that lining is probably broken down. So you basically have a precursor to an ulcer here. All right? And if any of this acid comes up here on that exposed wound around there, that's not good. So that's one of the reasons we do that protonics um, bolus and that continuous infusion for, again, upper GI bleeds of which we're talking about the bleeding varices. And then dopamine, probably because this person's crashing because they're acute blood loss. And then off to the GI lab, they go. All right, that is the end of that. Any questions?